on behalf of all my fellow trustees, I have to say, we love the Friends. They are great. They do such a tremendous job supporting our beloved staff by providing them opportunities to go to conferences, by providing cool things like the book bike, um, children's program. So we're so pleased that the Friends are our friends and the Friends of the Library. It's a big, big boon to what we do. Um, I'm always surprised when people are curious about what curators do. It's as though we had some kind of special training like Navy SEALs or there's <laughs> something mysterious about what we do. And I was sort of trying to figure that out as I was getting organized for this talk today. And then I realized why we curators are so mysterious about what we do. It's because we have so much fun. And if people knew how much fun it is to be a curator, they might stop paying us. <laughs> Monsieur? I should first thank Brian Hodgson, who is my tech support tonight. And if the, if the slides are wrong, it's his fault. Um, <laughs> the funnest things the funnest thing that curators get to do is organize exhibitions. So I thought I would use the exhibition that I was most intimately involved with most recently as a kind of way of explaining how curators put exhibitions together. And what you see, um, I was a lot thinner then, geez. Um, <laughs> this is me at the end of the process of putting together the Edward Hopper exhibition that was at the MFA in 2007 and then went on to the National Gallery and the Art Institute of Chicago. There I am holding forth in front of a painting that I suspect many of you recognize, Nighthawks borrowed from the Art Institute of Chicago. If there is a signature Hopper, that is it. But the actual process began three or four years earlier and here's how it came about. This is me, <laughs> over a cup of coffee, trying to come up with an idea for an exhibition. It occurred to me that it had been a long time since there had been a show on American paintings, and in particular in my area, which is early 20th century stuff. And so there I am, thinking and thinking, trying to come up with something that would be good for the MFA, and Hopper seemed a natural fit. The MFA, for starters, has two great paintings by Hopper and over a dozen watercolors and a ton of prints. It's always good to do a show in an area where the collection is already rich. So when you want to borrow something from other institutions, you have credibility. They say, oh yeah, it makes sense they're doing a Hopper show. They have all that good stuff. Hopper, of course, is an extremely popular artist. We know, we knew that a Hopper show would bring in a good gait. That is all you paying customers. Um, and in sort of looking into this, I learned that there had not been a Hopper exhibition at the MFA in more than 50 years, and what there had been at that time was a very, very small local effort. Finally, I decided to propose a Hopper show because I didn't like him very much. I thought he was a one-note artist, he's not melancholy, he's dreary, he's depressing, and so it was a chance for me to learn something to figure out what I was going to do with this, this guy that I didn't like very much and to figure out whether I was right about him. Um, so this was an easy sell to the MFA brands, brass. It fits with our collection. It was time for an American show. It would appeal to a collector of American modernism that we were courting. So went right on the schedule. Not a problem. I felt that we needed a partner to share costs to reassure potential lenders that this was a serious, significant show, not just a local effort, but who? Well, when you're looking for a date, you tend to look for an institution that has major pictures to lend, but in, that in this case, that would have been the Whitney. 
in New York, which has the Hopper Estate, lots of hoppers. Well, I didn't want to play with them because a New York venue would draw a lot of potential visitors off uh, from the MFA. And the Whitney didn't want to do a hopper show. They had been trying for years to escape the identity of as an institution that only did hopper or whenever they needed to pay the bills, they did another hopper show. So they were really not interested. Now the other option in choosing a partner for the exhibition was to work with an institution with real prestige and borrowing power. To me, that would be the National Gallery of Art, which also had never had a hopper show. Next. So I flew to Washington, took my pal Frank Kelly, that's him in there, that's me in the red hat, right? I took him out to dinner, plied him with wine, and made my sales pitch. Next. He was very excited and arranged for me to present the show to their management team, Gulp, the head of exhibitions, the head of publications, the director, and the deputy director. But that was OK, because the deputy director had been my mentor in graduate school and was at my dissertation defense. And he passed me. So I knew I was OK there. But they said yes, too. And boom, we were off. Next job, and this is not just for Hopper, this is any ex exhibition, is to line up the major pictures in the show. Get the real core loans, the famous pictures, so that then when you went to other institutions and more importantly to private collectors, you could say, well, the such and such a museum is on board with their so and so. So, hat in hand, I went to the Whitney and got early Sunday morning, and they were really nice about it. Then, Chicago. Now, if we got this picture along with early Sunday morning, we had it made in the shade. Everybody would fall into line. So, holding hands, knees knocking, Frank and I went to Chicago to make the case to our friend, the curator of the American collection, Judy Barter. Would she lend? Well, she's kind of a tough cookie, even though she's a pal. And so Frank and I said, OK, we're going to have to give her an exchange loan. That is something from one of our collections, a great Renoir, for example. Or that wouldn't appeal to her too much because she's an Americanist. But a great Homer, Winslow Homer, in exchange for this picture. This kind of horse trading goes on all the time. And as we were discussing all of this, Frank said, you know, the National Gallery has a policy against doing like exchange loans. So I said, OK, the MFA will do it. Uh, but anyway, we were there. We were ready. And Judy said, well, you can have the picture, but we want the show. Actually, that's, that, that's fine. What a wonderful tour, Boston, Washington, Chicago, except that especially when you're trying to borrow works on paper, it's very difficult to have a three venue exhibition because that means people are lending you things for a whole year. And somehow that seems a lot more daunting than seven, eight months. And works on paper should not be exposed to light that long. So it made things very complicated, but what are you going to do? So there we are. Next. Um, the next part is really the fun part. You get to travel around the country, look at pictures, and decide which ones you want to ask for. You can't just do this with color reproductions or images on a screen. They just don't tell the truth. You have to see them in the flesh. You have to see if they're in good condition. You have to see what kind of frame they're in, all that stuff. Um, and sometimes when you're doing this, you discover that your childhood favorite is really a dog. But you also discover that things that you didn't even know about are spectacular. So for example, I went up to the Addison Gallery of American Art in Andover to see this painting called Manhattan Bridge Loop, which is one of their most famous pictures. It's a celebrated hopper. We knew we wanted it, da 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 da. But they also had a picture 
called Freight Cars Gloucester that looked really dull in their catalog, but it's spectacular. It has incredible color and light, and I see you all saying, what is she talking about? Go see it. It is magnificent, and it is, for me, the side of Hopper that I really wanted to stress, not all the dreary melancholy stuff, but what he said about his art, which is, all I ever wanted to do is to paint light on the side of a house. Well, if this painting isn't about light, I don't know what is. Okay, so we're trundling all over the country. We have a checklist together. We send out letters requesting loans and begin doing research for the catalog entry essays. Part of that, for me, entails walking in the artist's footsteps as best I can to go where he or she went, trying to see what the painter saw in subject matter. Now, Hopper spent a lot of summers in Truro on Cape Cod, so of course I had to arrange a um, research trip there, right, in July? <laughs> he also spent several summers painting in Gloucester, and as I discovered, many of the subjects he painted are still standing and looking very much like they did when he was there. Next, please. Here's a case in point. Up top is our, our, the MFA's amazing watercolor called Anderson's House. So beautiful. And I took a little field trip to find it. I, I just knew it had to still be there. I mean, you wouldn't tear that down, would you? Anyway, I also thought it'd be fun to take a friend along. So I told my husband he wasn't feeling very well that day. <laughs> And he called in, and uh, we got in the car, and we headed off to Gloucester. And he said, well, where do you want to park? I said, you know, I don't know where I'm going, really, but I'm sure it's within a couple of blocks either side of Washington Street. So just sort of turn the corner and park somewhere, and we'll start looking. He said, OK. Pulled into his space, put a quarter in the meter, and I said, honey, we're done. He pulled up right in front of Anderson's house, which, is, which there it is. That's my photograph. Um, and as you can see, Hopper didn't change much, or, and, or, the owners of the house, knowing what they had, a Hopper house, kept it as he had with the dark shutters and the yellow paint, and it was very exciting. And then we went off and had oysters. Um, okay, next please. Here are two watercolors. The top one belongs to the Yale Art Gallery. That one belongs to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They are two watercolors done by Hopper, pretty much the same, no, I guess they're two years apart, of the same building but different sides of the building. Um, I couldn't figure out why he painted it, because it's kind of ugly. And you know, when Monet painted in series, well, he painted Rouen Cathedral, for heaven's sakes, not this dumpy little House of the Foghorn, where the Foghorn is housed. Next, please. And that's the MFA's watercolor, and that's what it looks like today. I mean, it is not what you would say a natural subject. But then I figured it out. I went with a, a friend of mine also working on the show. And as we were driving up the road, which we knew, we knew where this was, and we were driving up the road, on the right was one of the best clam shacks in the state of Maine. <laughs> And she said, oh, are you going to tell that story? And I said, yeah. And she said, are you going to tell about how I had fried clams and lobster roll? <laughs> so did Hopper. That's why he kept going back. Um, actually, probably not. But all of this kind of research really humanized Hopper for me and made me realize what I said before, that he is above all a painter of light. And so much of the melancholy and sadness seen in his pictures is exaggerated. He said about it, this loneliness business is overdone. And then he also said, I was always more interested in the sunlight on the buildings than in any symbolism. Next, next please. OK, so after we'd written the catalog and the book was designed and in production, it was time to worry about what the show would look like in our exhibition spaces. We worked with the designers on the layout, on the paint color. You'll be glad to know that that wall color is called mayonnaise. <laughs> in my next life, I want to be the person who gets to name the colors. 
And then the pictures started coming in, and I got to arrange them. And there is Nighthawks going up. There were some surprises along the way, as there always are. Next, please. Like many painters, like most painters, Hopper cared a lot about his frames, and he often, there are a number of letters from him to dealers explaining exactly what he wanted in his frame. When I went to the National Gallery to look at their picture, which is that one, <laughs> called Evening Cape Cod, it was in a brassy gold frame up there. I knew it was a new frame. I knew that's not how Hopper would have painted his picture. So I said to my buddy Frank, let's go look for the frame. So we had a great time kind of pawing around in, st in storage, and we found the original frame. And you know, <laughs> frames in the 30s and early 40s weren't necessarily to our current taste. This is called, it's kind of pickled walnut. It's kind of ugly and crude looking. Um, but it was very fashionable, and it's really how Hopper conceived of the picture as looking. It made it look better. The picture is a better picture in that frame. Trust me. Um, so Frank said, yeah, wow, fabulous. And he had the technicians reframe the picture and hung it that way until it was time to send it to Boston. So the picture comes in. I open the crate. And it's back in the gold frame. And I said, Frank, what happened? And he said he didn't know. And he discovered the technicians assumed that there must be some mistake. They couldn't possibly want to send the frame <laughs> picture in that doggy frame. So they reframed it and sent it to us in the new gold frame. Well, they fixed it. FedEx picture, the frame was here the next day. Next, please. OK, so the installation is finished. Those were the, the uh, banners in the hallway. The catalog was out. The book is read by critics. The critics come see the show. The public comes. You give tons of lectures, more public comes. You give more lectures. Then all of a sudden, three months later, it's over. And speaking for myself, I was relieved and very sad, um, as I hope this little narrative has shown you, putting an exhibition together is a lot of work, but it really is very satisfying. And I'm happy to say, not all shows are as complicated. For example, one of the favorite shows that I worked on with my good friend Sue Reed of the print department, which is called A Wash in Color, was a title our marketing department provided. Um, it was a show of watercolors from our collection, and you see Hopper, Homer, excuse me, Winslow Homer's Blue Boat and Prendergast's Umbrellas in the Rain, two masterpieces from that show. The current Hokusai show is the same kind of show, entirely from the museum's collection. So for the curator, it's one-stop shopping. You don't have to travel. You don't have to negotiate for loans. But the same rigorous selection process and research goes on. Next, sir. Or there was the Sargent show, which the Tate in London organized the Tate Gallery of, Art, of British Art. They couldn't do it without the MFA. We were the biggest single lender to that show. 20% of the works in that show came from the MFA's collection. But the Tate did all the other work. They courted the other lenders. They made all the transportation arrangements. They produced the catalog. All the MFA staff, myself included, did was to write for the catalog, which was fun. We kibitzed a bit about the selection. And then we got to hang up the pictures when they came in and pretend it was all our idea when the crowds rolled in and the critics raved. Ooh, yeah. What else do curators do? Oh, I'm sorry. That's one of the watercolors in the Sargent show called Cashmere Straw. Next, please. Well, curators do some boring stuff, too. There's meetings, there are paperwork, there are reports, there are blurbs for the PR department. There's also miscellaneous fun stuff, giving gallery talks and lectures and presentations to the donors and trustees. So being a curator means being a bit of a performer, although <laughs> that wouldn't be pretty. Um, next, please. One of the things that I 
most enjoyed, which is installing the galleries. You pick the paint colors, you decide how the walls are going to be configured, all that stuff. You arrange the works, you write the labels. This culminated in the American Wing, and you see two views of the Salon Gallery in the American Wing, the 19th century um, gallery. This is a mammoth project that was halfway done when I retired from the MFA, and even only halfway, it was an awful lot of fun, and I let you see the result. You've seen the results, and I let you judge for yourself whether you think it was a success. But the best thing, maybe, that we get to do as curators is go shopping. Now, it's hard to understand how with a collection, an American paintings collection, as large and as rich and seemingly comprehensive as the MFA's American Painting Collection is, it's hard to imagine we really need anything. It's like Imelda Marcos needing more shoes. Um, and it's hard to buy because art is increasingly expensive. Even the MFA, which has pretty good purchase funds, they don't go the way they used to, or as far as they used to, and of course, it's not the money that the MFA has to buy works of art is not, unfortunately, all for the purchase of American paintings. You have to compete with other um, departments. There are two theories of collecting, and we subscribe to both. First, you enhance your strengths. So if you have sergeant, you buy more sergeant. Second, you fill gaps. If you don't have X, but you have Y and Z who work next to them, you, you go after X. As I said, we do both. Sir? For example, the MFA is very famous for its folk art collection, particularly its portraits, its group and family portraits. And what I'm showing you here is a very large painting on the right by Erastus Salisbury Field of Joseph Moore and his family. And one of my favorites on the left, a portrait by an itinerant artist who worked both in Maine and in here in, or nearby in Charlestown, named William Matthew Pryor. This is the three sisters of the Copeland family. So this is in the category of building strengths because we have a lot of portraits of family groups, especially in what's called the folk tradition. But this painting came along and it was just knocked our socks off. It is a painting of superb quality. It is pink, as you can see, a color I like. Um, it's an artist we didn't have. Susan Waters is her name. She worked in upstate New York, and it was a woman artist. So it was just the perfect thing. And Brian, can you go back one? You can imagine what a nice wall it makes hung next to the prior, and that's usually how it is in our gallery. Next, please. Yeah. This is something that illustrates the filling the gap category. Up until not so many years ago, it was as though the 20th century never happened in Boston. This is something that we curators in the American Art Department tried to fix. It was hard, work is expensive, it's rare. Dealers knew we were looking, and I was the one who took the call about this painting, Jackson Pollock's Troubled Queen. When I saw it, I nearly, well, disobeyed all the rules of being a curator and said, yes, we'll take it, right then and there, without mentioning it to my boss or the director or seeing if there was any money to pay for it. It didn't matter. It was so good and so important that we had to have it. Happily, the dealer was willing to wait until I said, can you hold on a minute, <laughs> and grab my boss, and we did what we had to do to acquire it. It's also, and I think we all agree with this in any walk of life, it's always nicer to get presents than to have to spend money. So curators spend a lot of time cultivating collectors people with high quality objects, especially in areas we don't have. The best experience I had of that sort concerned a man named William H. Lane, Bill Lane, who lived in Lunenburg, Massachusetts. And he had been on the MFA's radar screen for quite some time, but nobody had ever sort of managed to connect with him. Finally, my then boss, Ted Stebbins, and I 
wangled an appointment and we drove out to Lunenburg. And it's a good hour and back roads and con con sort of confusing directions are involved. And we were supposed to be there, let's say, at 10 o'clock. We probably got there at 5 past 10. Mr. Lane greeted us at the door, and he was a big man, saying, where have you been? And Ted and I were trying to hide behind each other the entire time. What he be meant was not, why are you five minutes late? What he meant was, where has the MFA been all these years? Because his collection was not only brilliant, but contained everything we need to basically bridge the gap, for, well, to, to give us some a real standing in an area that we had nothing, 20th century modernism. So through working with the Lanes, who lent to a number of exhibitions, I think we did four or five exhibitions based on their collection in the first couple of years that we were courting. Through their generosity, we now have probably the best collection in the country, or maybe the Phillips collection is better than we are, in the work of Arthur Dove, the great abstract painter. We have some pretty fabulous Georgia O'Keeffe's. We have works by Charles Sheeler, by Stuart Davis, by John Marin, all the textbook names of American modernism who were otherwise virtually unrepresented in our collection. It was an amazing relationship and a very successful one, both for the Lanes, I think, because this is what they always wanted for their collection, and for the MFA. My last story concerns a different kind of picture, but it was equally important to the MFA in filling a significant gap. Next, please. The two major American painters, although they weren't American, at that point we were English, um, of the 18th century was John Singleton Copley, and I'm showing you his Samuel Adams on the left and Mercy Otis Warren on the right, both hanging in the um, entrance gallery to the American wing right now. Copley was a Bostonian, and so we have tons of paintings by Copley, many of them at the very highest level of quality, the, what you see here. The other great painter of the 18th century was Charles Wilson Peel, who was from Philadelphia. We don't got nothing of significance. And interestingly, the Philadelphia Museum is the same way. They have a jillion peels and nothing much in the way of Copley. And we kind of tried to correct that for some period of time. We lent them a couple of Copleys, and they lent us a couple of peels on a kind of long-term loan. But all good things come to an end, as did that relationship. We're still friends with them, but it was time. So we were looking desperately for a Charles Wilson peel. And I was approached by one of the owners of this gentleman, whose name was Captain Timothy Matlack. He was a Revolutionary War hero. He was a military leader, a member of the Continental Congress, the author of the Pennsylvania Constitution. And a lot of his career is alluded to in the objects on that table. This is a great Peel portrait. And the owner, one of the owners said, would you like to have this on loan. And I said, yes, please. It came to us. We hung it right up. It looked dandy. And then there were more conversations. Um, the woman who had approached me, I'll call her the good sister, <laughs> wanted to give the painting outright to the MFA. The, I won't blank, brother wanted money. I don't know. That's not fair. I have no idea what his circumstances were. And it may be that he could not afford to donate his share of the painting, or maybe he was greedy. I'll never know. The third, the third sibling, you realize, of course, I'm going to tear your tongues out before you leave here so you can do this. <laughs> there was a third sibling, a sister. She was OK with giving the picture to the MFA, but she didn't like her brother very much, so she was, didn't want him to get any more than he did. I'm obviously embroidering this a lot. I spent hours on the phone doing what seemed to me to be family therapy, in which I was not trained. <laughs> we finally worked out a deal, very complicated, called half purchase, half gift. So basically, if the painting was worth a total of $300, each sibling's portion was worth $100, they gave us 
a half portion. They gave us $50 worth, and we paid them $50 each. That's why we pay lawyers. <laughs> so as I said, all of this was on the phone, and it happened, and I was thrilled, and it was very, very important for our collection. And then some years later, I met the good sister at lunch. I had never laid eyes on her before. She had come into the museum to see the painting, never introduced herself to any of the staff. She just came in and went, left. <clears throat> and then she said to me, I'm so glad it worked out. The painting looks so good in your gallery. And I said, I couldn't agree with you more. You made it happen. May I give you a hug? Um, <laughs> and that's how paintings come to the the Museum of Fine Arts and any other collection by a strange and wonderful series of circumstances. But that's enough for me. Um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Brian. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you have time for questions? Let's do some Q and A for 10, 15 minutes, whatever. Sure. 10 minutes anyway. So thank you. That was fabulous. Judith. Never, 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 no, 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 no. Of course. But curators and conservators are well trained. This is what we do. We, you know, the first thing you do when you enter a museum and are responsible for works of art is you take a long course in how to handle objects. And things do happen. Things happen in transit, which is why people are rightly a little nervous about sending them. Um, we've gotten smarter and better and more efficient about transmitting works of art. The museum handlers are very well trained. And so, in fact, given how much art moves in and out of museums all the time, it's astonishing at how little goes wrong. And that said, a lot of what happens to works of art is because of this is one of my favorite phrases, what our conservators call inherent vice. Um, it's, it's, kind of, it's not quite like you know, having bed bugs, but it's um, artists work with materials that are not stable, and deterioration happens that way. And in fact, that's really more often responsible for a work of art not looking as well as it might than improper handling. Yes? Oh, I wanted to borrow from them big time. Oh, the question was why we didn't want to partner with the Whitney in doing a Hopper show. A couple of a couple of reasons, um, and in fact, the the curator there who is responsible for the Hopper collection is, is a good friend, and we talked about this very frankly. They had recently participated in another Hopper exhibition, and it was really almost too soon for them to do one again. And he was himself, my friend was himself, planning on doing a show, which was one of the best Hopper shows ever done, on Hopper's drawings. And that was not an area that I wanted to work on, just because there are so many, they're almost all of the Whitney, and I was afraid that if we borrowed a lot of their drawings, we wouldn't be able to borrow early Sunday morning, for example. Um, and so, so they were fine with us doing paintings. I wanted to emphasize watercolors, not drawings. He wanted to emphasize drawings, not watercolors. It was a magic marriage made in heaven. And if the Whitney had the show, New Yorkers would not come to Boston to see it. So, Dean? Uh, Carol, I'm wondering if you were the speaker at a talk I went to at the MFA when the Hopper show was and the person, the little woman, started out by saying, applications in pop culture, and then had a series of slides of Hopper images applied with humor. And the one that stays in my mind is Nighthawk, the 
diagram. Right? With Homer Simpson. <laughs> 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 Eating donuts. Right. And I'm wondering, was that you? Were you the speaker? Well, was it a fabulous talk? <laughs> then, absolutely. <laughs> I have no idea. I gave so many Hopper talks, <laughs> but probably. And there are, I have a big, thick file of cartoons and other artists' takes and takeoffs, especially Nighthawks really gets it a lot, but other, other of the paintings do too. But if you ever want to have a wonderful sort of Hopper experience, rent the movie Pennies from Heaven which starred Steve Martin and Bernadette Peters, and it's set in the 20s and 30s, and there are tableau vivant of a lot of Hopper paintings. It's just amazing. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Carol, maybe this is an unfair question to ask, and you can take the fifth if you want, but um, I'm not very happy with the, uh, some of the architectural changes. I'm not, you know, the, where they have the cafeteria, mm -hmm. seems to me to be a lot of wasted space there that, otherwise or in the future could be used for an art. And the other thing is uh, whether, now that Malcolm Rogers is leaving, um, what can you say, I know he's brought a lot of people to the museum, mm -hmm. raised funds and all the rest, been some questionable exhibits. How do you assess his stewardship? I think, uh, I'm going to take this. Um, <laughs> I think it's hard to know. I mean, he has changed the culture of the MFA Dramatically, he's brought in a lot of money, he's brought in a lot of new people, he's brought in a lot of collections. Um, as you say, there are things that he's done that have been questionable. But he's, he's still on the throne and will be for another month. And it'll be years before we can really put into perspective the contribution he made and the, trans the, the changes that happened. Were they for the good? Were they for, for not? The same thing with the, with the architecture. Is, was Norman Foster a good choice to build the American wing? You know, we thought so at the time. Will we think so 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now? Who knows? Yes? Um, I've only seen good art in museums. I've never walked into somebody's house and seen a fabulous, you know, famous painting by a famous painter. And I, I wonder, when you go to uh, people like the Lanes, they have paintings like that in their home, how, what do people do to protect them and preserve them and keep them safe? Well, some collectors are very conscientious. They work with museums to make sure they're, you know, they're what, what's it isn't getting too much light. On the other hand, it's their thing and they can do what they want. And obviously all those people have really elaborate security systems and, and so forth in terms of that kind of security. Um, so people are, you know, as responsible and conscientious as they want to be. And, you know, people, you, we, it's all, we're always learning about how better to display things, how better to protect things. And I think with private collectors, the, the same thing happens. We're always happy when someone comes to us and has, you know, something really wonderful and says, you know, I, I think this painting isn't as look, looking as good as it could. Can your conservator look at it and tell me what's going on? That makes us happy because we know that, you know, we, we are professionals and we can give them good advice and hopefully they'll take it. Yes? Pictures of how they had them in their houses. 
house. Was this the cone collection? Were they Picassos and Matisse and, and things like that? Up on the walls and like stuff in corners. I think that might have been an exhibition sent to us by the Baltimore Museum of Art of two sisters. I don't know about the boarding house part, but they were friends with Picasso and Matisse and all of those artists who gave them these masterpieces as gifts. So. I just remember one of the things that we were talking about how they sort of had so many of them that they would just stack them in the corners mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. hold them up as they Yes. And it, I just, I love that because it sort of shows how every, because most people only interact with art with seeing it on the wall in the, in right. the galleries and whatever, this gave an opportunity to sort of see art in the wild. Right, and right. I, I well, paintings, sculpture, all that, is precious, but it's also kind of intimate and personal experience. And what, you, what you've what you talked about is just that, and it's why people become curators, because I'm never going to be able to own any of that stuff. But to the degree that I am given the privilege and responsibility of caring for it, it's mine. So. Well, Naomi, one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what that does to museums who are wanting to look at things. Is that a serious question? We're out of it. We're out of it. That's it. One of the best things that happened in the two, um, well, not the best things, but one of the, the sort of most dramatic illustrations of the idea of schadenfreude was when it was announced that the Getty Museum, which had more money than anybody at the time, was not going to collect American paintings. My colleagues and I said, oh good, oh good. And then Bill Gates and Alice Walton came along. Museums can't buy in the big leagues anymore most of the time. We can be smarter and find something that is spectacularly beautiful and important and not by a name brand, or recognize something as, say, a Titian that no one else has and be proven right. But it is harder and harder and harder, even for very wealthy museums like the Getty, to compete in this atmosphere. Happily, I guess, most of the action seems to be in contemporary art or early 20th century European art so that people interested in other areas still have a fighting chance. But basically, we're done. Okay, we'll take one more question and then we'll, we'll have some more coffee and a chance to uh, chat with Carol privately. Anybody else? Okay, John. Were you able to take uh, any sort of advantage from the uh, We turned down two. Less <laughs> uh, competition, Less competition, but less wherewithal, because of course our money, you know, our funds are invested as well. So. All right, one more. How do you feel about Robert now? He's pretty good, you know. He's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> 